for Shepherd Community. Bob brought enough for an entire army today. So if you saw that, he was just kind of back there. Like the, the semi. You know? <laughs> so we're continuing to collect these instant oatmeal packets for Shepherd Community. We're the oatmeal church. So don't forget to bring a box or two to help out. If you're at the grocery store, just go ahead and grab one. They're actually pretty cheap, uh, but they really help out the food pantry there. Midpoint Bible Study continues to meet every Wednesday at 10 a.m., here at the church, everyone is welcome to attend. So if you have an opening on Wednesdays, 10 a.m., please come on over and, and join, join the group for, for that uh, study. So within the last few months, we have experienced some changes in our children's ministries. If you would be interested in helping out with children, please contact Pastor Margie. She's going to get you the, the information, the resources, training, and all the things that you need. Uh, we 
And I, I don't think we've actually ever mentioned this out loud, but I want to mention it. That with all of our children's workers, we do background checks and things that are necessary for training, for safety. So we want to make sure that if you do volunteer, that that is an expectation that you will have, um, that you're coming into that, that that's, that's very important. Also, uh, a Nazarene missions trip is being planned for July 8th, 11th through the 18th of next year. Obviously, not it would be kind of short notice for now uh, if it were this year. But uh, July 11th through the 18th, 2024, participants will be going to Panama. So uh, the estimated cost of the trip is $2,000, and a $100 deposit is due by August 20th. So for more information, you can contact Holly Williams. We can get, get you her information. Um, and the information is, is actually on the slide, apparently. So, but if that's not enough time to look at to take a picture or memorize, we can definitely get you that information. Is it trips to No, no, it's oh, for, okay. you know. So you, for trips to well, Yes, you, uh, uh, thank you for pointing that out, Pam. Actually, the reason it says that is because often, traditionally, it's just been adults. And uh, what they're saying now is for the Panama trip is that they're encouraging whole families to go serve together. So, uh, so not just adults, but, but also families. So, so please, if you are interested, um, let's let's make it happen. You know, so there's that, information in the, on the bulletin board. Also. Yeah, so there's information out there. Can you take a picture of that as well? As we continue in service today, um, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us and. Uh, um, as we continue in service. I'm really excited about the message today. I don't know if you saw in uh, on Facebook, but I'm what, what I would say nerding out about the subject matter. Um, so I, I hope that, um, that we can connect mentally. Uh, the, the idea of communion, we'll be celebrating communion together uh, later on. So teaching a little bit more about what the meaning of it is. So let's pray as we gather. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for who you are and who you've called us to be. Today, Father, we ask that you just pour your Holy Spirit out upon us. And um, we just ask that you, you give us the energy and the passion and the desire to know you more. In your name we pray. Amen. And also today, I want to thank Pastor Jess for filling in today. And I'm glad to see that Becca is feeling much better today. That's, that's very good. Um, very, very excited to see you all here today. So, thank you so much.
and go downstairs. You can have a seat for a little bit. And we'll ask the ushers to come forward and we'll take our morning tithes and offerings. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come to your house to worship, to share with other Christians in fellowship. We also thank you for the opportunity to give a portion of what you provided for us back to you, for you to use in the furtherance of your kingdom. We just ask, Lord, that you would bless the gift and the giver for the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
And I mean, can, would she mind annoying me? <laughs> Jessica is someone that is struggling with, when we talk about demons, we're, we're talking about, you know, oppressive instances in which, in which the devil is really trying to bring her down. Jessica is dealing with not only uh, personal struggles, but also self-harm and things like that. And uh, if you would gather around Mandy, or, or we're just gonna stop everything right now, because Jessica is worth stopping for. Oh, yeah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just ask that um, you be with Jessica today. Right now, she's out of town. She's in a place right now that she should be happy, excited, and having a lot of fun. But Lord, you know um, what kind of struggle she's going through with the, with the addiction that's getting to her, and with, with the self-harm, and the, and the self-talk, and the self-doubt, and all of those kind of things. Today, Lord, we just ask that... Uh, as we anoint Mandy uh, on her behalf, that you will just be ever present with her. Help her to feel encouraged. Help her to know that you love her. Help her to know that there's a church out here in Fishers, Indiana, that doesn't know her at all, but knows that God loves her, and so do we. Lord, we just ask that you be with her and her family right now, and her struggles. We ask that you give her a miracle. Help her to see you breaking through the darkness because what we realize is that when darkness is present when light comes it has to obey light and today lord we just claim that in the name of the father son and the holy spirit and today lord we just ask that you be ever present in her family and in her life help her to have that knowledge and understanding that we have that, that there are people praying for her and that love her, never seen her face. And then that can happen because Jesus is a part of our, our lives. We love you, Lord, and we already know and we declare victory. We declare victory because you are the God of victory. And you do not bring about confusion. You're not the God of confusion. You're the God of victory. We claim that today again in your name. back to Indiana back in 90, was it 92, 92? There was a family that moved across, that, that lived across the, the uh, apartment hallway. I guess you might say from us. Um, and, and me and my brother and the two kids that were there became really close friends. and um, So we grew up together. Uh, the, the two children were twins. Um, and the, the boy who I became close friends with uh, actually took his own life a few weeks ago. In the midst of this, so that's a big prayer request, obviously, for the family, the hurting sibling, and you know, all of that. 
and everything in the way. In the midst of this, I had the opportunity to speak with one of his close friends who, you know, just needed someone to hear the anger and the frustration and, and the cuss words, you know, and, and all those kind of things that came out because of the, the pain. And I, I just want to say that while it is very dark time, and, you know, I don't want to diminish that, that I just want to say that I'm very thankful that I got to minister to this, this man um, and listen um, imperfectly. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm just praying, if you pray with me, that this opens the door for the friends that we grew up with, for the friends that we graduated with and things like that, to, to talk more about Christ's love and, and all of that. So. Would you stand and sing this testimony song with us? <laughs>
of so many ways that you've been good to us. God, sometimes things don't go the way that we want them to go in life. And it's easy for us to not recognize your goodness in those times when things don't seem to match up. When people are, do things that hurt us. When life circumstances are difficult. God, help us to recognize your goodness in those times too. Help us to see your hand in everything that is around us. Ways that you are opening doors and closing doors and providing, taking care of us. God, help us to have a greater awareness of your goodness every moment. And Lord, speak to us through your word this morning. In Jesus' name. And before I get started today, um, I wanted to read you a text that I got. Um, if you remember a few weeks ago, uh, we had Heather Parks and her family with us uh, leading worship. And she, I wanted to read you the text, or at least most of the text, that she sent me after she left. And, and by the way, for context, her daughter is over here playing guitar. Uh, Lincoln is over here. And the uh, one so she's in the middle. Her daughter's name is Nevaeh. Heaven spelled backwards. Nevaeh and I have decided we're going to kidnap you and your family and your church family and, and selfishly move you all closer to us. Your presence, personality, and spirit, meaning the church, uh, are inviting and relatable. Um, uh, and then she talked about my dry humor skills and all that. <laughs> and um, the people in the church were welcoming, warm, and friendly. Also, and I want to make sure I read this part, your wife is amazing, thoughtful, and so kind. She says, dude, seriously, you all share You all share a piece and peace of the kingdom there. God is Lord, and it is evident in relationship, communion, message, and worship. It was so beautiful, healing, and humbling to simply be present. Jesus was evident. Thank you. Um, I'll just leave that. I, I want to thank you for being invited and welcoming and warm and, and to those who who come and visit and, and all of that. Um, but I wanted to give you that in insight from someone who visited. And that day was interesting because we kind of had to <laughs> turn on a dime a little bit, you know. We were expecting a, uh, some things to happen that didn't happen and that's okay. Um, but God but God oriented us exactly where we needed to be. Um, sometimes I think that we do things over and over and over and over again and that God asks us to do and we just look at him and go, well, why? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing X, Y, Z? It just seems like it's just this constant, God, you've told me to do this. I don't see the immediate payoff or the reward. I don't see where this is leading. Um, but God tells us, number one, first of all, you said that you're following me. Why won't you obey? If you would obey me, then you would, you would see that. But sometimes we don't see the answer to the why until we look back. We go, oh, that was, the, that was the reason. And sometimes our exercises in obedience are things that God is working a muscle within us. Let's use the word muscle for a moment. In which we can be prepared to handle something that he has for us. You know, if we look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, we know that the Old Testament was before Jesus, and the Old Testament was during and after Jesus. Well, after is not really the right word, but... But you know what I'm trying to say there. What we've realized is when you look at the structure of the Old and New Testament, everything in the Old Testament somehow points forward to the central portion, which is the cross. 
where Jesus sacrificed his life for us. And after that, he was resurrected and hey, he's still around, you know. But if you look at the New Testament, it's, it's a little different. And it describes this, this process and this reflection of what happened at the cross and the resurrection. So, to review, things in the Old Testament points forward to the cross. Things in the New Testament, let's just say for argument's sake, point backwards to the cross. So, the central focus and the paramount action and event of the Bible is the cross. And if we were to somehow remove the cross and how uncomfortable it is, then we're losing a lot. In fact, we're losing everything. In fact, if you were to remove the cross from it, the Bible just looks like a bunch of kind of rote rituals that just don't make any sense. Like why, why foot washing? Why, why communion? No, that's what we're talking about today. And we'll, and we'll all be taking communion together here shortly. But why? Well, what's supposed to be the deal? So this, this whole month, we're talking about this concept of why, this question of why. The, these things that we as Christians do in church or just out and about, that someone from the outside, quote unquote, might look at that and go, oh, you're kind of weird, you know? And granted, yeah, we're kind of weird, you know? If we we're really to be honest with ourselves, I think we can all raise our hands and say we're kind of weird in some way. But whenever we're comparing our actions and our thought processes and our direction to that of the world, yeah, of course we're weird. That if we're constantly changing with the tides and, and the turns and the winds that the world has to throw at us, then, then really the scriptures and, and Christ himself, it, they, he kind of, they kind of, kind of, kind of, sorry, I, I got I went to bed uh, early this morning. They go by the wayside. What's the point, you know? So let's talk about the Old Testament for a minute and all of these rituals that we see. The festivals, the rituals, the things that, that were celebrated by the ancient Jews. And we look at those things and we go, well, some of that was just strange, really strange. Today I want to talk about a ritual that they had even before Christ ever came. And today we're looking at the context of the Last Supper. Because this Last Supper, what we picture here was Jesus and his disciples sitting around the table. And, and some of us maybe have read scripture and we thought that Jesus said, hey guys, I'm about to die. We're going to have a Last Supper here at about seven. Uh, so if you could come, that would be great. If not, don't worry about it. You know, That's not what the Last Supper was. The Last Supper was something that they were already planning to have, but they didn't call it the Last Supper. It was a part of the Passover Seder ritual. And if you know anything about the Passover Seder ritual, it celebrated the fact that the Israelite people were, were made free from their bondage. If you remember the story, the Israelite people were slaves in Egypt. And now they were delivered. So this idea of using like unleavened bread, for instance, it symbolized the bread that they had. Back then they had to grab their bread real quick and get out of there so that they could escape the Egyptian captivity. God told them to do that. So I want to read you today uh, a little bit about the, this Last Supper. It's what we, what we picture when we're talking about the Last Supper. Remember in the context of the Passover Seder. The Passover Seder was a meal that they had during the Passover season. And each piece of this Passover Seder, which years ago I actually talked about each individual piece and what they represented, but everything had a meaning. And I want you to picture for a moment, Jesus has not died on the cross yet. So essentially, all of these represent little isolated incidents which seem kind of unconnected in some ways, other than God being sovereign over the Israelite people. But, but this particular meal was meant to kind of celebrate and remember that God is in control. <clears throat> so today I want to read you, we're in the Passover Seder meal, we're having this meal together, <laughs> and Jesus and his disciples, 
And we call it the Last Supper because we know, if we look a little bit further, that Jesus is going to be betrayed, and he's going to die, and he's going to be resurrected. I want to talk to you about the meal. I want to read, read, read about this for a moment so that we can get the picture in our minds. And we're going to start with Luke chapter 22, and we're going to start with verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? they asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he, in that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it, is, has, as it has been decreed. But woe to the man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be or who would do this. Well, we know it's Judas, right? Spoiler alert, it's Judas. Judas is the one that betrayed Jesus. And this, if you can picture this scene, it's at night. And they're having the final pieces of the Seder meal at night before they eventually go to bed or before eventually something else happens as we know that's about to happen. But it's really interesting. What's the significance of this? First of all, let's start with the, the cup of wine or the, or the different cups of, of, of grape juice for us, you know, I guess. But, uh, you know, they had two different kinds of cups that they would share. One was called the cup of salvation. And the other was cup, the cup of sanctification. So it was kind of a before and after type, type situation. So, so these cups would represent the cleansing power of God and the transformative power of God in their midst. But today I want to talk more about the bread. It's interesting. When we take the bread, Jesus says to his disciples, this is my body, broken for you. You know, and and we look at that, and and I think if we were to be an outsider, quote unquote, we would look at something like that and go, "You're eating a, a Jesus' body. What's what is this? What, what's going on here? Cannibalism? That, that that word comes to mind. We don't understand it. But to understand why Jesus said what he said, they ha you have to understand the reason for the bread being there in the first place. See, in, the, in this particular meal, they would actually have three different slices or different pieces of what we call matzo or matzah. You ever heard of matzo bread, right? Matzo bread or matzo, you might call it, depending on where you're from, is the special kind of bread that does not rise. It's unleavened. And that's to symbolize the kind of bread that they had when they escaped Egypt. <coughs> they would have three pieces, three pieces during this meal. The, the beginning piece, the middle piece, and the end piece. That's what they would call it. The first, second, third. Let's call it that today. 
One of the traditions as a part of the Seder meals, after everything was eaten, after everything was done, they would have these pieces that were sitting there ready for everyone to eat. And the interesting thing about this bread is that in order to make it correctly, you have to pierce it and strike it. So picture a big cracker, let's say this big, I was hoping to have one here today, but, but a, peck, a cracker about this big. And it is not risen, it has piercings and stripes. And the reason that they would do that is so that it would not rot. So they could put all the ingredients together, pierce it, make sure that the steam would go through, and it would cook thoroughly throughout. Three pieces of bread. The first piece they would, they would put to the side, and the second piece, they would do something really interesting. The whole family would get together, and they would take this middle piece, and they would break it. And usually, I mean, can you ever break something perfectly 50-50? I don't think so. There's always a smaller piece and a larger piece. <coughs> the smaller piece, they would go ahead and eat right there, and that, that was fine. And they would eat the other pieces as well. But they would do something really interesting with this larger piece of the broken second piece. They would take it, wrap it in a white, a perfectly white cloth. This cloth is just like the bleach, just white you could think of. And they would, and then probably usually the father was leading this part of the ritual. He would go hide it somewhere in the house. You ever heard of Elf on a Shelf? Or anything like that? Kind of like that? No, it's not really like that. He would take this piece of matzo, this broken piece, and he would put it on the shelf or put it on somewhere and, and hide it. And the kids, this whole this is a whole part of the, the Seder meal is a fun little game that the kids would go all around the house or all around outside or inside, and they would try to find this piece of bread that was wrapped in white linen. So then Inevitably, a child or the children would find it. And a part of the tradition was that when they found it, that they would save it to right before they went to bed. And this piece, this cracker, this cracker, this bread, would be the last thing that they ate before they closed their eyes. So before the darkness came, <coughs> this would be the last piece. I want you to think about that just for a moment. Think about everything I just taught you for just a second. The three pieces, the middle piece, the second one, the breaking of it. So this, this cracker, this middle cracker, I'm going to call it a cracker, I'm sorry. This middle piece of bread would be called the bread of affliction. Uh, it had two names, the bread of affliction but also it had a weird kind of feeling like it's an opposite name, the bread of freedom. It's kind of weird, right? So suffering, affliction, freedom. So they would go hide the larger piece, they would go, they would go um, find it, and they would cheer, and they would have a reading, and things like that. And then that piece was the last thing that they ate before darkness came. And why was it that that was the last thing? Because that that affliction and freedom, that that wafer cracker piece of bread, was supposed to symbolize this last action or last uh, event that happened right before morning came, before the light came. So, all of that—it's all jumbling around in your head right now. Why? Why is that important? is because that was the bread that Jesus was talking about when he said, this is my body. Isn't that interesting? So think about this tradition. Think about this idea. Think about this bread of affliction, this affliction that the Israelites were going through in Egypt. And back then, ancient Jews would have looked at that and went, oh, I, re I remember the stories that I heard. I remember, oh, it's so great that God delivers and eating this bread of affliction means that even though we eat it and it's bitter and it's salty and all of those kind of things, I know that this is the last thing I'm going to experience before the light comes, before I open my eyes again. So I want you to fast forward for a moment to a time in which Jesus is holding up this piece of bread. 
And he's saying to these people, this is my body broken for you. And you see on the, you remember what, what it looks like, the piercings, the stripes. What had to happen in order for them to have the unleavened bread so that it wouldn't rise and the air wouldn't get caught in all those kind of things. This is my body broken for you. For the forgiveness of sin. This is the last thing that they would have eaten. Obviously, they would have drank, drank uh, a little bit afterwards, but this is the last thing that they would have eaten before darkness came. Jesus was wanting to connect their understanding of affliction, anticipation, and then freedom with what was about to happen. Fascinating that these people for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years would have been taking part in this seemingly just endless ritual that they would have done because my family did it and my, my parents and their grandparents and, and all of those kind of things. We do it because we're supposed to and it, it helps us to remember what God has done for us. But for people back then, God has done things for us, but I don't know if I could really say he's doing things for us right now. But Jesus comes onto the scene and says, all those things that you have done and all the obedience that you've given have been leading to this event. There is affliction coming. There's darkness coming. It's going to be discouraging. And you're going to think to yourself, why are we going through this? Why are we having to, to dredge through the muck and the mire of our lives but what Jesus tells us, and what we prayed about here a little while ago, is that one interesting thing about darkness is that it seems like it takes over everything until light comes in. And darkness must obey light. That's the rules. Darkness thinks that it wins, you know. You can imagine darkness if it were what we call anthropomorphic, whatever size, you know. Anthropomorphized, I can't say that word, but if it were put into human characteristics, we're thinking darkness is like, oh man, I have my reign over everything. But the moment you get a spark or a candle in that room, it's done. It's over with. Darkness lost. So imagine Jesus sitting with his disciples. <coughs> Telling them that this is my body, broken for you. He's going to be, well, what he's telling us is that affliction is coming. But also that he's going to be buried and hidden in a perfect linen cloth. So we, we see that symbolism also carried over. And the most innocent of innocent are going to discover him. And then the discovery of that is going to bring about light. It's going to bring about celebration. After they found the found the wafer, after they found the cracker, after they found the bread, they would have this big celebration. It's like kind of like Christmas, you know. Do we see the connection here? That sometimes we read scripture, and I want to give this overarching generalized statement. Sometimes we read scripture and it seems so segmented, compartmentalized. Oh, here's a story. Oh, that's great. I can learn something from that story. And then we go on to the next story, or the next little bit of wisdom, and we start picking little pieces of fruit off the tree, when actually what we need to do is step back and look at the tree as a whole. What God tells us through the actual ritual of communion, and a lot of us, when we hear the word ritual, we kind of get, I don't like that word. So I'm going to use it. When we go through the ritual of communion, we are celebrating the fact that darkness obeyed light. Light came in, and affliction was gone, and freedom came. We're celebrating that. And, and we're also celebrating that with everyone simultaneously who are, who are doing it together today. Maybe not at the exact same moment, but you get my idea. But also people in the past, present, and future. So we are celebrating this idea of unity together, and we've talked about that before when it comes to communion. 
But sometimes we forget what it's all about. It's about Jesus. It's about him and him alone. It's about him inviting us into his story so that we can acknowledge that affliction is not the end of the story. Suffering and pain and darkness are not the things that God puts a period after. See, what comes after that is freedom and deliverance and light. God is going to win. He already has. But, well, not really but, but in addition to, it doesn't make suffering any easier because we still go through it and it's hard. Maybe in some ways it makes it a little easier if we, if we know that God is going to come through and we are claiming victory and we truly believe in that, but at the same time, it's still painful to be in the dark because when we're in the dark, we get hurt, we stub our toes, we, we, we can't see around us and we get discouraged because the things around us don't seem to be illuminated. Through communion, Jesus is telling us that there is affliction, there is suffering, there is darkness that exists, but light is conquering it. Light is coming. Why do we celebrate communion? Why do we do this thing that seems so rote and so programmed? Well, I hope it's not programmed after when we really, really think about it. It's to celebrate and recognize death, affliction, and life. It's not the other way around. It's not the decrescendo in the music sense. Life doesn't end on that note if, if Jesus is in your heart, if Jesus lives through you, if Jesus is in control of your life. There are ebbs and there are flows, but ultimately what Jesus is telling us is that he has the key to life once again. We celebrate communion because we find unity in that from believers past, present, and future, but also we reflect on the fact that Jesus conquered death. And that death did not win. And when God is a part of it, he, death can't win. With that said, usually what we do is we have communion, we go through that ritual, and we just get it done. Okay, that's part of the service, let's go. But I'm going to have the, the ushers go ahead and pass out the elements today. I want to take my entire time preaching today to set us up for this event. When you take the bread, when you take the cup, what is it you're doing? Is it just something you do because you've always done it? Or is it a celebration of something that is brand new? You can be brand new. Even if you're sitting in, in anger and darkness and in, in affliction, you can be brand new because God says that he has the final word. So if you brought something to church today, anger or disgust or, or, or frustration, why don't you just drop that for a moment and recognize that God is sovereign and he provides and he loves and he wants you to know him more. We're going to sing here... Um, and I'll, I'll come back to, uh, to the audience. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
And Jesus took the cup and he raised it to heaven. And he blessed it and he passed it out among them. So they all could drink. And he said, this is my blood. Shed for you. May it preserve you blameless into everlasting life. Drink and when you do, do so in remembrance of me. Thank you God for that reminder of who you are. We ask that you help us to take this message and this reminder throughout the rest of the week with us. Lord, help us to lean on you when we are discouraged or we're angry. Help us to lean on you, Lord, when we are joyful, when everything is just going right. And all things, Lord, help us to depend, be dependent on you and be solely focused on you. In your name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.